It's that time of the year again when you realize that you did not get paid enough. Okay. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that one? Okay. You're going to stores and your kids treat you nicely. I don't know if you guys noticed that, you know. Your kids are nice to you. It's the weirdest thing, you know. Even my mother-in-law gives me a phone call and asks, how am I doing? It's, it's strange, you know, it's strange. And so JJ, <laughs> being a little bit more the eldest, you know, he, he's got intelligent conversations. So he just do, he doesn't talk about wanting gifts, but I've noticed an uptake in how he expresses to me what he likes, okay? But with no, there's no, he, he claims there's no agenda. Can you guys just change the stage display, please? There's no agenda, apparently. He's just having that conversation with you. He said, you know, Dad, do you remember when we went to the store the other day? The, oh, I loved, I loved that Harry Potter Lego. I loved it. <laughs> and so now, now, now he's getting smart because I'm getting irritated when he tells me about what he loves. And now he asks me, Dad, do you like Harry Potter Lego? <laughs> so I kind of get the picture. So we, this morning, if you are here for the first time, welcome. We are starting our new Christmas series, The Hope of the World, The Hope of the World. And it's my agenda over the next couple of weeks to tell you the Christmas story and then we're just going to take out a couple of a uh, few important points. And I want you to really open your heart. I know we know the Christmas story, but I really believe that um, as I'm going to speak, there's going to, just going to be a little bit of stuff that's going to pop up that we can apply to our lives. So we're going to start out of Matthew. It's the first book in the Old Testament. I'm just not going to say anything on that point. Okay, I'm just not going to say anything. We're going to read from Matthew chapter 2, and there's about 10 verses that we're going to jump from, uh, then we're going to jump to, and it's a story of the wise men, the wise men, okay? It's a good opportunity to um, tap on your husband and say, Merry Christmas. Okay. <laughs> now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Verse 2 saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. Verse 5. They told him in Bethlehem in Judea, for, it, for so it is written by the prophet, and he's quoting Micah in this section, and you, O Bethlehem, um, you, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. Now listen carefully. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Verse 7, the last couple of verses. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. Verse 8, and he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose, went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was verse 10 the last verse for the introduction <laughs> when they saw the star they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy they were happy so this morning my theme is i'm sorry if you're watching online i'm back now okay my theme this morning is the hope of the world and we're going to talk about highlights in the darkness highlights in the darkness now we all know the christmas story but there's something wrong with our minds that when we read a story we always look for the main characters okay we always look for the main role plays in a story but today i want to bring your attention to side role players on this process and hopefully there's something new that you can learn something new that you can absorb and maybe we can put on this this thinking cap to understand what was happening in the story of jesus because there's a lot of tension when jesus was born there was a lot of tension when Jesus was born. So now we're going to jump back to what I just read and we're going to break down verse by verse. And I hope there's a couple of interesting stuff that I'm going to share with you that's going to pop up. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Herod the king. Now we need to pause right there. Okay. 
when you look in the historical books, I think there's about records of nine Herodians. Okay, that's a real word. I'm a professional, okay? There was, there's about nine of them, okay? So I know every time we read of Herod in the Bible, we think it's the same guy, but it's kind of not. There are multiple Herodians, okay, in the Bible. There's a clump Herodices, okay? There was a, there's a lot of them, a lot of them. But we, we get the significance of the story of the birth of Jesus when we just pause and realize who we are talking to. And here's the phenomenal part, okay? Here's the phenomenal part. That the names that we are reading about pops up in extra biblical material all over the show. In other words, the books that are considered historical in the secular world place, in academic circles, the names we find in the Bible pops up in parallel to them. Now, if you've been in our church for a long time, you know how we do this thing, okay? We read the Bible, we look at the literature that was written in the same timeline, and then we look for links. Why? Because it builds a bigger picture for us. It builds the context for us, and it makes a little bit more sense. Now, you're going to recognize some of these, these, um, these names because you, like me, watch very historical accurate cartoons when we were younger, and we are very clued up about the history scene, okay? So it, it becomes phenomenal because, you know, Sometimes we read these pages and we just glance over them, but we don't understand the emotion and the tension that exists within this. So now, I'm going to go to a commentary, and they're quoting from a book called Josephus. Now, you will hear this guy a lot because he's got phenomenal historical books, especially in the time when Jesus lived, and he wrote a lot of fantastic stuff. And the, the universities use this for historical purposes. So we're taking university books, applying that to the Bible, and checking what we get from that. Is that fun with you guys? You sound so overconfident this morning. So let's start off. Okay. That dude, okay, but number two from that guy, okay? For 2.0, okay? Herod's father formed a close relationship with Julius Caesar. Anyone have heard of Julius Caesar before? Okay. Just please just lie and say yes, you've heard of have anyone heard of Julius Caesar before? Yes, okay, okay, fantastic, great. Phenomenal guy, great leadership. He's got a big role in the historical books. Now, Herod's father, the guy we just wrote, re read about in the Bible, his dad had a very interesting relationship with Julius Caesar. After coming to Julius Caesar's assistance in Egypt, he was re rewarded with Roman citizenship and the role of administrator of this whole area where the story of the Bible plays out. Are you guys with me here? Are you, are you sure? Sure, okay. Let's go a little bit deeper, okay? While his father was administrator of Judea, okay, it's not a spelling mistake, it's the larger section of the map when you look on the geo geographical papers that I googled. And then you see Herod, his son, okay, popping up and now he was appointed governor of Galilee. But just pick up on this quickly, okay? Yeah, he's just a governor, okay? He's just assigned in a certain position. But now we need to know that Herod's name is linked to Herod the Great. There are certain sections where this specific Herod I'm talking about is referred to as Herod the king, okay? So you need to understand, this is a guy, his dad was in a war, he got favor with the Roman Empire, and he was appointed, and he appointed his son in a certain area, and he's climbing the ranks very slowly. This is important information, okay? Because it's going to build out the story of Christmas. Okay. Um, the people laundried him, okay? They laundered him for stamping out the banditry that devastated the Galilean countryside. Now, why is this important, okay? I need you to understand that I'm quoting from a historical book that is accepted in universities, and they are pointing to these people that we are reading about in the Bible, okay? Are you guys with me still so far? Okay, it gets a little bit, uh, a little bit deeper now, okay? After Herod defeated the guy that was suffering a lot, Antigonus, okay? The last Asmonian ruler, Caesar recognized him as king of Israel 30 years before Jesus was born. Now we read this, and this seems nothing to us. But ladies and gentlemen, when you step in your father's footsteps, and there seems like this, can I use this, I don't want to say family business type of language, but you have this Roman Empire oppressing your people, you stepping up in leadership, and now you get a small area that you need to lead. But you lead this area so significantly that the empire that's oppressing you is promoting you. That speaks of phenomenal leadership. You know why this is so significant? Because some of us, some of us, and I, I'm going to include myself in this. We can't even manage our kitchen properly. 
We lose socks in the washing, ladies and gentlemen, okay? So I want you to understand something. This was a guy that was managing people and promoted when there were oppressors over him, but he did such a good job. This was no ordinary man. And this is why Josephus comes, and Jesus is born into a time when Herod the Great was ruling. But the plot thickens a little bit more. The reason why Herod was referred to as Herod the Great was because of all this, uh, go to the next one, because of all the stuff that he was building, okay? He founded a new seaport. Now, now that's fine, okay? Some of us can't even afford our mortgages at home, okay? This guy built, he built harbors, okay? He built cities. He expanded the temple. He repaired Jericho and Samaria, and he built several fortresses. This was the capabilities of a phenomenal leader. Do not miss that when Jesus was born into the scene, into the world, as this was something simple and small. No, 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 no. Jesus was born into a time with phenomenal strong leaders with their own agendas. And Jesus is born as a small baby. Can I, can I show you, can I show you the magnificence of Herod the Great? There's this place called Masada, okay? And this was basically a fortress built on top of this hill. And this was done by Herod the Great. This is one of his building um, structures that's standing until this day. The guy that we read about in the Bible, the guy who's playing, okay, he's actually a major role player, but a secondary role when we talk about Jesus, his handiwork is still visible to this day. People go visit this. There's this ramp on the side because of this, this rebellion that took place and uh, the Roman Empire built a ramp to get on top to defeat the people up there, but we're not going to talk about that. If you want to, if you want to do some Bible study, this is phenomenal stuff. Masada is the place called Herod the Great. Go study this. It's uh, the Herodian dynasty. It's phenomenal, phenomenal stuff to understand what is taking place over here. This is the guy where Jesus is born into. This is the guy ruling. It's a strong, phenomenal guy. And the Savior of our world is born as a baby dependent on the structure that is governed by man. And no small man, ladies and gentlemen. No tiny guy. A a guy that is remembered as the great. The great. Phenomenal, influential, fearless. Now, I'm going to read you the next verse, and I want you to think of this. We're going to put ourselves in Herod's shoes for a second. Okay. I want you to think of this. Verse 2, remember we read verse 1, okay? Saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? The wise men coming to Herod, they've noticed a star popping up, and now notice this. Can you imagine the offense? That you have been ruling and reigning, and look what you have built. Look what you have achieved. And wise men come to you and say, there's someone greater than you. And now Herod wants to know, where is this phenomenal king? What has he done? Nothing. He was just born. And if you know, if you read, if you understand Herod's character, and we're going to get into, into a little bit stuff a little bit later, if you can get into his character, I need you to understand that this should have been the most offensive conversation that took place in his life. He defeats armies. He's got access to the biggest empire of its time. He's got influence. He's got strength. He's got fortresses. And the wise men come to him and tell him, a king of the Jews has been born. And he's standing this side and he's thinking, listen, you're what king? I had to go through loops. My father had to fight in a battle. Then I had to prove myself before I even got a hint of the title, king of the area. And he gets born. Jesus gets born into this tension that exists. Now, this is why our Bible writes further and explains the story in verse 3. And it says, When Herod, listen to this terminology, the king, not the governor, not just a normal guy, Herod the king, he worked for this title. He fought for this title. When he heard this, he was troubled. Of course he's troubled, okay? Of course, I don't want to say troubled. I think he was angry. I think he was frustrated. I think he was insulted. Because it's wise men. It's not silly men. It's not stupid men. It's not paranoid men. It's wise, smart people showing up and troubled. And here's the thing. It wasn't only him that was troubled. It was all of Jerusalem with him. Why? 
Because war comes in when two leaders resist each other. You see, we don't think about this. This is a nice Christmas story. We have presents. Everything is fine. Ladies and gentlemen, when two parties stand up to one another and are fighting for power, people die in the middle. So now Herod knows what's happening. There's this, this rumors of a king showing up. And immediately Jerusalem becomes tense. Why? Because they've been experiencing wars with the Roman Empire consistently. There's this pressure. There's this tense. And for some reason, God chose and said, this is the best time for the Messiah to be born. Ever thought about this? Why then? I mean, if the Messiah could have born any time, if the Messiah could come any season, what they choose, the Messiah is born into the most weirdest situation that you can ever find in the history. And there we have baby Jesus in a manger and the powers of the world is trying to draw strings. The powers of the world is trying to manipulate. But here's the thing, here's the thing. And here's the, here's the scary part. All of us would have responded like Herod. Why? Because Herod had a legacy to protect. Herod was not only standing for himself, he was standing for what his dad did as well. His dad fought, his dad established, and he was taking reins, and he had a lot of children. There was no TV. He had a lot of children. Like a lot. Okay. And it was just this whole idea that now he's responsible for his family. And he's got this legacy to protect. So now, I want you to understand that when the moment came when Jesus was born, the world was against him the moment he took his first breath. Because Jesus was going to offend the way the world does things. It gets deeper. Herod goes, and now in this context, remember Herod, okay? He calls all the chief guys. Not the local guys, the chief guys and the smart guys. He calls them together and he needs to have a meeting because what's on the table for Christmas is war and he needs to figure out how what they're going to do with this idea. Get on to the next one. And they ask him and now the smart guys come back and they tell him, the prophecy was written. And they're quoting, they're doing what we would do today. They're looking at their scriptures that they had at the time. They're figuring out, what does the Bible say? Okay, it wasn't then called the Bible, but you guys are, what does our religious scriptures say? What does our viewpoint say? Where is this Messiah going to come from? And they study the Bible, and they look at this, and, he's, and the, the smart guys pop up, and they say, it has been written by the prophet that then, listen, okay, next one. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. <coughs> now I can just imagine what's happening in Herod's story. Now, it's not only wise men showing up declaring that a ruler was born. The religious leaders who's got massive influence in their communities is showing up and said, it is true. And immediately, Herod the Great, his whole empire, sits in the balance because of a small young boy born to a carpenter. And rumors have been going on. And conversations have been happening. You know what's actually interesting to note? That the Herod and his family, they eventually ended up ruling 130 years. 130 years. So here's the thing about Herod. He did his job properly. Phenomenal. That even with Jesus popping onto the scene, okay, but Jesus had a different agenda. Okay, I'm not going to talk about that. But I want you to understand who Herod was. That in the sense of pressure, what he established lasted almost 130 years through severe circumstances that took place. So obviously it makes sense. Herod comes to a point. Where he summons the wise men, but he needs to do it secretly. He needs to do it secretly because Jesus was building fame even before people knew his name. That's a I did not intend that rhyme, but it's my pleasure. Jesus became famous for doing nothing. And he had influence 
between what we see in the church back there, not the church, the religious organizations and the wise men that were prominent elders in the community. And he noticed something and he can't just do something to Jesus because it will affect his position. So now he does things in secret. He does something in secret. He plots and plans quietly. And he becomes very smart for a very short moment. And you guys go to the next one. And you know the story where it says, And he sent them to Bethlehem, the wise guy, saying, Go search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Okay. But here's the thing. The wise men are called wise for a reason. Okay. So you guys know they jippered. Do you want to know why they jippered, jippered Herod? Well, thank you for asking. I was waiting for this question the whole morning. Okay. Josephus tells us, remember, I'm not quoting from the Bible. I'm quoting from a historical book, okay? Just, just a historical book. Um, sorry, apologies. Can someone just switch off the alarm, please? Load shedding is just messing that up quickly. All right. So look at this. Okay, check this quickly. Um, let's go to the next one, to Josephus. Remember the wise men coming, and he says, I want to worship this guy. Listen to jo Herod's character eventually. Joseph, Josephus recorded Herod's execution of his own sons due to rumors of mutiny. He had his own sons strangled. So I want you to understand Herod, okay? And I want you to understand the wise men. I want you to understand the religious leaders of his time. You have this whole setup. You've got this leader fighting for what he is. He's so in a fighting mood that he's willing to take the lives of some of his children because they are not in line with this, this legacy that he's building. Do you understand the danger that Jesus was exposed to? And he was, I don't want to say, obviously, he had no clue he was a baby. The danger, the setting, this Christmas story that we enjoy, but there was real tension that existed. He was willing to kill his own sons. And there was a other drama that happens in other areas with wives. I mean, it's just crazy. Just go study the guy. It's just phenomenal. Okay. Now, it carries on, and, and just, just bear with me. I'm going to start preaching soon, okay? So just go to the next one quickly. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. Next verse. And when they saw, and when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. With this whole tension, this whole issue, they've got Herod the Great standing in front of them, and they've got this mission just to worship a king that was born. That is the tension. But there's something that grabs my attention in this whole story. We know the story of Jesus. Oh, I think we know the story of Jesus, okay? We know the story of Herod. We understand the wise men. But in this whole narrative, there's one thing hanging around that everyone seems to miss. And there's a small star in the backdrop of this entire story. I want you to pick up what I want to share with you this morning. Herod the Great was standing there. The wise men. Jesus was being born. The church leaders. And out of this whole context. There's a small star. Hanging around. And just doing its thing. The star is not arguing. The star is not complaining. The star is doing one thing. The one thing that it's been called to do was just shining in the sky. And because the star was shining, the star set in motion conversations that would last for thousands of years moving forward. In the middle, at the back, somewhere hidden in this dark. So I want to Take the story, and I'm going to give you a couple of points about the idea of a star doing its thing in the background and playing a significant role in this Christmas story while powerful men are fighting it out, while spiritual things are taking place. When God has ordained something to happen, there was just a star that was shining. Now, this is going to be mind-blowing, okay? You guys, it's going to be so good, you're going to want to come back next week, okay? I can guarantee this for you. It's so good. It's so good. Okay. Are you guys ready for this one? Okay. Stars are luminous. Okay. This was the biggest revelation of my life. <laughs> Obviously, you guys can tell I spent a lot of time in sermon prep this week. Okay. <laughs> 
Stars give off light. Here's the thing. In this whole narrative taking place, in this whole drama taking place, the star was doing one thing. He was shining even when it was dark. It was, I, I know it's obvious. I know it's obvious, okay? I know it's obvious, okay? But it was just shining. It was just doing his thing. I'm taking this whole narrative and I want to focus on the star and I want to draw it to my eyes to think there's a lot of things happening wrong in our lives, right? There's a lot of things that goes crazy, especially during this season, okay? We're fighting about a lot of things. People are concerned about the elections popping up. There's a lot of drama happening. Up. And in this whole story, there's a quiet star that's asking us, all we need to do is shine even when it's dark. I, I want to I wanna take this one step further. I want to take it deeper. I want to say shine, especially when it's dark. And we are not supposed to allow these role players to numb the light that we are called to shine because when we take our light away it's just complete darkness but we have called to be this light that is shining in a dark world but when we lose our light it's just going to be dark now light can complain that star can complain because there's a lot of stuff happening and i'm just there shining and i want to tell you today this is a message of christmas that i want to share with you and we're going to talk about this this idea of christ being the hope of the world i want you to understand he did what he did to invest into your life so that we can be the hope of the world and i'm not saying we are replacing jesus i'm saying we are extension of jesus and we are called just to hang around and shine but there's a, there's a warning I want to give you about shining, okay? There's a warning I want to give you about shining. I need you to be aware that we are responsible to shine like a star and not like the moon. Okay, let me explain. Stars shine because they have light. They create light. A moon reflects light. Um, there's, there's this mooi woord in Afrikaans, okay? It says, skyn heilig. Skyn heilig. You are shining holy. You are shining holy. I want you to be careful. I want you to be careful that you seem like light, but it's because you are reflecting someone's light next to you only. And that's why we sit in churches where people in the world look at us and they get frustrated with us because we are all moons. I almost want to say we are mooning them, but that might, <laughs> I don't know, that's not going to... Apologize to the public watching online. Okay. <laughs> we are reflecting light. And that is dangerous because we have a, a, a resemblance of holiness. But that is not what is hiding behind the story. There was an element that was producing light. Do you... I'm just, just going to not say that part. Filters, filters. Nee, nee, nee. <laughs> I want you to get the next part of, of a lot. And this, the, this is really going to make you come back next week, okay? I want you to understand that light and heat is connected. I want you to understand that when light is produced, 99% of the time, there is also heat being produced. So much so that when it comes to stars, there's even radiation being emitted from the stars. There's a, I want you to understand that light and heat sustains life. Because the sun is producing light, and because that light produces heat, our entire livelihood is sustained because a star is just shining. There are people around you that is being sustained because you have the ability to shine and produce light and heat. You are not the main role player. There's some guys fighting, building stuff and doing things. But I want you to be aware that just be because you are willing just to be the light that you have been called to be, there's a lot of things that's being sustained in this life because of you. So on this point, I want you to look very cool on your face, okay? If you want to look cool, frown and smile. Okay? So I want you to frown and I want you to smile and I want you to absorb the next statement. Stars are hot.
you are hot. I might slightly be lying to certain individuals in the premises, okay? But I was just teasing. I'm just teasing. Stars are hot. The star in the story of Jesus, hanging in the background, just doing its thing. I want you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to say to you. December season is here. Christmas, family, drama, all the things are happening. Do not underestimate the power of doing your thing. Do not underestimate the power of you showing up for your family. Do not underestimate the power of your forgiveness. Do not underestimate the power of your grace. Do not underestimate the power of your perseverance. You know you get frustrated because you've got a forgiving heart. I want to tell you, oh, you have a blessing, ladies and gentlemen. I know you get frustrated, man. Because you are shining, because you are producing it, it's maybe not so much fair to you because it's costing you something, but your family is sustained because of your heart. The people around you sustain the community. Your church is sustained because you are just shining your light. So if Herod wants to fight, let Herod fight. But we are going to shine our lights in any case. If the world wants to battle for power, we are still just going to be there. And we're just going to highlight that a king has been born. The hope of the world has been born. And you can fight and you can argue. And all I'm going to do, I'm going to show up and do my thing. Because I know that is what sustains life. Now, I know you might not feel this, okay? But I want to tell you something that Jesus said many, many years ago. Look, at Luke, and this is my last verse, then I'm going to conclude. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. This is like in COVID time, walking to a place and not sanitizing your hand. It's offensive, okay? And the Lord said to him, now you Pharisee, you cleanse the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside you are full of greed and wickedness. Now hold on, I know this is a negative sense, but I want you to understand the positive sense of what Jesus is saying. Listen very carefully. I'm talking about shining light. I'm talking about giving life. And I'm talking to you that feels the inside is not right. I'm talking to you when you feel you don't feel strong enough. You don't feel good enough. You don't feel worthy enough. I want, I want to talk to you that feels like I can't be this light. I want you to listen very carefully. You fools. Okay. <laughs> okay, to the second part of the verse, okay. To the second part, did he who made the outside, did not make the inside also? In other words, I want you to understand that the God that created your outside is the same God that created your inside as well. The same God that created the, the, the physical elements is the same God that did the emotional and spiritual elements as well. I want you to understand that you have the ability to be light. I want you to understand you have the ability to be hot, sonar makeup and way less. You have the ability to sustain life just by shining. I need you to understand that the topic, and I want you to take this message into December, we need to be highlights in the darkness. We need to be bright lights in the darkness. We need to shine, especially when other people around us are not shining. And in doing so, we are bringing honor and glory to the hope of the world. We are leading and pointing people towards the hope of the world. We are showing them who the God is that we serve. This Christmas, this season, as we're moving forward. Thank you. Light. I want you to take hold of this. Don't be discouraged because of other people's arrogance. Don't be discouraged because of other people's darkness. Don't be discouraged because other people are not willing to shine. If God needs me to be a light, then I'll put up my hand and try my best light that I can be. If God needs me to, to give out heat and energy, I'm going to put up my hand and do the best that I can. And it's going to feel unfair. It's going to feel lonely because darkness overwhelms. But if you look up to the sky, there's a lot of stars shining around there. That's producing the light that's sustaining our life. Do not grow tired of shining.
your light. We will carry on next week. Let's pray. Father, we want to say thank you for your mercy and grace in our lives, Father. Thank you for being good to us, Father. Father, this message as we are celebrating the birth of Jesus, Father, we, we are noticing that there are so many, many um, principles that's being shouted at us in this story, Father. We want to bow down before you and say, Lord, sometimes our lights are a little bit dim. Sometimes our light gets a little bit cold as well, Father. But we just want to surrender our hearts, Father. Sometimes we get frustrated with Herod. Sometimes we get frustrated with the wise men. And sometimes we even get frustrated with the families and the elements and the people around us, Father. But we just want to focus on one thing. We're going to do our best to show up for you. We're going to do our best to shine for you, Father. And in a season where families are reunited, Father, in a season where sometimes many times troubles also come and heartache comes, Father, we just want to declare, Father, whatever is waiting for us, Father, we just want to be highlights in this darkness because we know when we shine bright, we are talking about our Savior that was born. Father. Thank you for your faithfulness. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.